Uh, body organisms are mentioned of HIV or hepatitis A, B, and C. Loss of bodily function, which may include an elderly person who requires a catheter or hearing aid, uh, disfigurement such as scarring or birth defect, and behavioural manifestations of the disability. I might note that many people who are disabled do not consider themselves as disabled. So what does disability, I'm sorry, what does discrimination disability actually mean? Well, under the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992, there's two definitions of discrimination. So there's direct discrimination, and that's when a person treats someone with a disability differently than they would treat someone without that disability in circumstances that are not materially different. And the second part of this is when a person does not make or proposes not to make a reasonable adjustment for someone with a disability. So the effect is that person with a disability is treated less favorably than someone without that disability. To give you an example, a case study of Max Worthy and Shaw. It's a federal magistrate's court case in 2010. Now, the, the lady M suffered from Crohn's disease. She had other physical impairments as well. She required, she required to wear a colostomy bag and she worked part-time in a food retail outlet, uh, a lunch bar. So when the business changed hands, the new owners required her to work extra hours. She couldn't work the extra hours, the additional hours, because of her family commitments. And the new owners, we call Mr. and Mrs. S, she said that she'll be given extra support. But she, she struggled with the increased hours. With those additional hours, there was a lot of stress. And she, uh, with the Crohn's disease, that causes a lot of severe pain as well caused her worry, concern, and she needed to have sick leave to have medical treatment. She tried to contact her employer, Mrs. S, but there wasn't any success. Anyway, while she was off sick, she, she saw a job in the advertisement um, advertised in the local newspaper for a position in the same food outlet. Now, when she contacted her employer, she said, Oh no, we're just trying people out. You know, we said we'll help you out. But um, what what actually happened was Mrs. S. She told M that she had not been dismissed because she was trying to reassure him that she hadn't been dismissed, and but simply had not returned to work. But Mrs. S. kept referring to her colostomy bag, and in the end, she said, "Well, look at you running around working for us with that." bag hanging off you. Now the discrimination affected Anne's health and of course other social engagements and her employment capacity because she was very worried that other employers were going to say the same thing about her colostomy bag. The outcome of this was Anne was discriminated against on the basis of her disability and family responsibilities. So the federal court Complaint. The decision there was that the complaint was substantiated and damages were awarded to approximately $63,000. And $5,000 were given just for that one comment about her cost to me back. That figure also included loss of wages and sex discrimination as well, but I wanted to focus on the disability discrimination. So indirect discrimination under the Disability Discrimination Act. So when a requirement or a condition is set which is not reasonable and someone with a disability is unable to comply with the requirement or condition and the effect of the requirement or condition is to disadvantage that person with a disability. So the other component of this, when a requirement or condition is set, which is not reasonable, 
and someone with a disability would be able to comply if a reasonable adjustment was made, but it is not. So the effect of the requirement or condition is to disadvantage that person with a disability. In other words, there are no, and I'm going to give you a little example of it now. So in this study, this is Clark and the Catholic Education Office. This is a very, very well-known case, not only for indirect and direct discrimination, but also the introduction of the disability education standards in 2005, which those of you who have children, a child or know a child that's disabled might have come across before in the education department. Now what happened here is that a high school student had to participate in classroom activities without the use of an Auslan interpreter. Now this child had had an Auslan interpreter majority of his life. Instead, the school replied, re relied on note-taking to communicate with the student. The parents of the student wanted to make a complaint that doesn't allow the student to ad adequately participate in the classroom. This was held as an example of an indirect and later indirect discrimination because the school required the student to participate and receive classroom instruction without the assistance of an interpreter. So you can imagine if they're writing notes down, it's back and forth, back and forth, it would be quite difficult for a child that is deaf. This requirement was more difficult for the student to comply with, and the requirement was unreasonable. So the direct discrimination may also be applicable, which can include failure to make the reasonable adjustments. They failed the reasonable adjustment to provide an Auslan interpreter. So the student was treated less favourably than a student without the disability in circumstances that are not materially different. Now, I'm just going to do a little bit more on that and in the next, in a couple of slides. So what areas of life does our law cover? Well, my area is work, employment, education, access to premises, goods, services and facilities, accommodation, land, clubs and incorporated associations, sport and administration of Commonwealth law and programmes. So really public areas of life. It must, for me to be able to help you, it must occur in public life. Not all situations will trigger the elements of disability discrimination. So, for example, a client with a disability may come to me and say they're going through family law proceedings, we're the parents, and our child has been taken away from us by DCP, and they say I'm not a fit parent, they discriminated me because I'm disabled. Unfortunately, I cannot help them, and that will fall under the Family Law Acts okay, and DCP. Do you see the, so I, I only work within the public areas of life. Now, when, when I said less favourable, basically the major difference is that in the case of direct discrimination, the treatment is on its face less favourably or unfavourably. Whereas in the case of indirect discrimination, the treatment on its face is, on face is quite neutral. But the impact of what you're doing to that person with a disability is less favourable to a person that hasn't got the disability. Now what does it mean in part of the definition um, of circumstances that are not materially different? It means that the circumstances, because a person requires an adjustment, it requires a comparison between a person with a disability and a person without a disability in the same fact scenario. That's your comparison. A person with a disability and a person without the disability. 
and just talk about what is the requirement or condition. In indirect discrimination, a requirement and condition appears to be mutual, but a person with a disability is unable to comply and is disadvantaged. Go back to the note taking. Do you think how long it will take all day for a child to scribble down you know, the notes? So the example requirement or condition is where the Catholic Education Office required the student to participate and receive classroom instruction without the assistance of an Auslan interpreter. So therefore this requirement was more difficult for the deaf student to comply with. This requirement was unreasonable. So with, the, with what is disadvantage, so we're basically breaking down the definition of the DDA Act, or Section 5 and Section 6. So seriously disadvantaged means if her, in person Queensland, if the, if the child was deprived of the opportunity to reach his or her full potential and perhaps to excel. And that was what was considered as being seriously disadvantaged. Now, there does not need to be a motive or intention to discriminate. So why was the person treated that way? Was it because of their disability or was it because of some other factor? So there are two or more reasons for treating a person. So one because of the person's disability and the other might be a completely unrelated reason. This is, um, in 2003, Purvis and New South Wales Department of Education and Training is quite a, is the landmark president in the High Court. Um, it involved, this case involved a student who was at a high school. The child had severe brain injury, the child had encephalitis at nine months old. And from that, of course, had the acquired brain injury. And the child was unable to control his temper. He was disciplined at school, suspended from school many times. The question was whether he was treated less favorably because of his disability. Chief Justice of the High Courts held that it was not because of his disability that he was suspended. It was because he was a danger to other students. Just on that point, um, dissenting was um, Kirby, uh, uh, Justice Kirby, Michael Kirby. His comments um, were to the fact that what Chief Justice Gleeson of the High Court did was within the DDA there is, there is a characteristic or manifestation of a disability. Now, as you may know, in head injuries, perhaps some of the side effects of a head injury or a, mass, um, or a characteristic is that sometimes their behaviour can be a little erratic or they have an epileptic fit or they might bang their head against a brick wall or, you know, there is sometimes there's some ongoing side effects from a head injury. So what um, Michael Kirby said was it seems that the High Court had to force the actual disability from the character, you know, characteristics and the symptoms post head injury. And that's what had seemed to happen in this court case. So we are really waiting for this one to be overturned by a new case that doesn't divorce the characteristic and manifestations particularly for head injury, because all the children or adults I know, there will be bound to be some residual symptoms there. So that's what we're waiting for. Now in this case, the Police Association of New South Wales and the Commissioner of New South Wales Police. So in 2010, we had been a police officer for two years and applied to join the State Police Protection Unit, which is similar to the TRG, and the police force refused me to have what they call an exposure test to tear gas. 
It was a prerequisite for joining this elite service. The Peace Force had a policy that any officer who had a history of asthma, including childhood asthma, could not take this test. Now, when V applied for a job, within his medical assessment, he put down that he had one uh, episode of asthma as a child. The thing is, he, as a child, he was dancing around the camp farm, and there was a bit of kerosene that got spilled, and he got a bit wheezy afterwards. He went off to the hospital, got the treatment, and so he had that one episode. Since then, he hadn't had any other episodes at all. He was a swimmer in the Australian national swim team, no asthmatic medication, and two doctors' medical reports stated there was no evidence of asthma. So the outcome of this was that V was discriminated by the police force, and they presumed that he had a disability on that one episode. So he got awarded over the Netherlands as well. I just want to talk about reasonable adjustments because I'm sure that um, many of you, if you're mobility aids or have been using, you know, people using wheelchairs, um, where reasonable adjust adjustments are required. So, under the Disability Discrimination Act, an adjustment to be made by a person is a reasonable adjustment unless making the adjustment would impose an unjustifiable hardship on the person. And the next paragraph is important because an adjustment is a reasonable adjustment if it balances the interests of all parties. So let's look at the examples of reasonable adjustments. And it's modifying premises. People that require a wheelchair access, they need ramps, they need accessible public toilets. Modifying or providing equipment, changing normal procedures. And I think we talked about, and the way I can put in fibromyalgia is you know, perhaps altering flexible times of working and um, you know, uh, computer screens, equipment, and working around, probably working around the fire and my item because it affects people differently every day. So are there any other limits on reasonable adjustments? Well, if the person has no knowledge of the disability, not the client, not you, but the other person who you think is discriminating against you, if they have no knowledge of the disability, if reasonable notice of adjustments are required, required, that means not I want them tomorrow, but if you've given the person reasonable notice, any practical adjustment requested, sometimes there's always an unjustifiable hardship saying we can't do it, health and safety concerns, any building work that needs to be done, and of course the duty of care to the person that has the disability. So the relevant circumstances, factors considered to determine whether hardship that would be imposed would be unjustifiable hardship, well we're looking at the nature of the benefit or detriment likely to accrue or be suffered by the person concerned. The effect of the disability of any person, the financial circumstances and how much it's going to cost required to make the availability to, to be made, sorry, uh, the availability of finance and other assistance. And the DDA says that some hardship is reasonable. So if you think you've been discriminated on the basis of your disability or mobility aid, I see, um, you know, if it's a walking stick or a frame or anything like that, then if you think you um, have been discriminated from, you can make a complaint to the Equal Opportunity Commission or the Australian Human Rights Commission. The Equal Opportunity Commission is based in Perth 
And the Human Rights Commission, Commission is based in Sydney, in New South Wales. To submit the complaint, you can do it by, um, you can do it verbally, or we can do it in writing. Probably better in writing. Note, once you have done that, the notification of acceptance will be sent to you by the Commissioner, and that your complaint will be sent to the other party, to the respondent. Then there will be a conciliation conference, so we arrange a date where they organise yourselves and the other party to come to, together for mediation. Now with Australian Human Rights Commission, they travel around Australia quite regularly. Sadly, they don't fly you to Sydney for a, for a little holiday. <laughs> they will come here. <laughs> um, it can be done by telephone link up, but sometimes it's better to see you face to face. Uh, in, there's no right for legal representation in relation to the Equal Opportunity Commission. You have to seek leave for a lawyer to, to appear on your behalf. Now, the resolution, if the conciliation process is successful, there is a settlement deed drawn up. There's no, often no mission, was no mission of liability. And there may be a possibility of appeal if you're not satisfied with the outcome of the conciliation process. Just going to talk about the Equal Opportunity Commission. It deals with state-based legislation. So with that, it means that it deals with the Equal Opportunity Act. It only deals with complaints that have originated here in WA. So here, if you have a complaint in Darwin, you can't raise because it happened actually in Darwin, you can't raise it here in Perth. If the complaint does not resolve, then we can actually appeal, if the case has merit, chance of success, to the State Administrative Tribunal. Now the tribunal is not a cost jurisdiction. It, it means that if you are unsuccessful, then they're not going to award costs against you. Okay. For compensation, <coughs> the cap is forty thousand dollars. All right. So forty thousand. With the Australian Human Rights Commission, they only deal with complaints that come under the federal legislation, which is the disability discrimination. So you have equal opportunity is the state. The federal legislation falls under the Australian Human Rights. If the complaint does not resolve, you can appeal the complaint to the Federal Magistrates Court. Now, before any client wishes to do that, I highly, highly suggest <coughs> that you, I recommend that you seek independent legal advice because the federal court is a cost jurisdiction and if you are unsuccessful then the other party can ask for costs against you and you don't want that, you don't want that. So that's why we check that your case has a reasonable prospect of being successful. I highly recommend that an independent legal opinion is, has a look at the matter as well before you take it to the federal court. In, there is no cap on, on damages in the Human Rights Commission. There is no cap, there's no ceiling of compensation. However, if you request $1 million, you have to justify why you think the other party should give you the $1 million, mm -hmm. all right? So you can't just pack a figure, but you work through it to see this is the amount I want, this is because the reason, the following reasons why. Often, from my experience with the Human Rights Commission, is that the 60% of the complaints are resolved at conciliation. 
because nobody really wants to go to court. The conciliation process, it's in both EOC and human rights. It's informal, but the deed that's drawn up is similar to a contract. So the other party has agreed to do this. back on the um, ESC is, and the human rights, there is a limitation period of 12 months. So say for example, uh, somebody discriminated me on the basis of my disability today, then I have from the, to two, the 2nd of May 2014 to put that complaint in. So you're given 12 months. If you go over that 12 months, then each commission, either commission, will say, well, we've had 12 months to do this, where have you been? You know, why haven't you put it in or made a complaint you know, beforehand? And to get that extension, you have to have a very good reason. So, for example, you've had 13 months in, in Greylands and not seen the light of the day, then that would be quite a justifiable reason. All right. The other thing to um, limitation, if you lodge in with, say for example, you had a complaint against, um, oh, if you work for customs, for example, the department, you know, the customs at the airport, that's Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. If it's a Commonwealth complaint, you have to put it in the Human Rights Commission. All right. We advise people who are, are making a complaint regarding education, anything to do with children and education who are disabled, to put their complaints into the Human Rights Commission, simply because they encounter the disability education standards. They, they, take, um, they handle the standards as well. Covered a lot for you, and your mind's getting all over the place. Mm -hmm. Where do I fit in in this? Mm -hmm. And that's a good question because you're probably wondering, well, what has this got to do with me? And if the way I can see where I'm, I looked at quite a few cases, and most of the cases I saw are to do with workers' comp, workers' compensation. I couldn't find any any with discrimination. But where I think it will lie is if there is an, an aggravation of your pain and your risk if you're working the computer or you're working or some days they say, well, why haven't you come into work? Or well, I say, I'm having a really bad day and I couldn't get out of bed, but I'm all right here at lunchtime. So I think that's something of the flexible working hours equipment and um, your day-to-day, -day, um, you know, your working day-to-day, -day. and mobility aids as well. I think that, that's something else. I'm not sure, um, perhaps I'll throw it open to everybody, um, how, how you would see it, I see discrimination in areas that you might think that you've been discriminated from because of your fibromyalgia. Anybody got any questions? I think it's done. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes, yes. Um, I'm a web content manager, so my area of interest is websites and things like that. And so yes. I've done some stuff in the study at the University of South Australia about making accessible websites. And so that's something from the designer's point of view that we're are working to uh, obtain so that people who have limited sight, limited uh, ability to use their hands or feet or whatever it is, mm -hmm. or even uh, to be able to see, to make websites able to be used like that. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think from what from my reading, it, it, that's definitely you know a public function because people need to go to... It's a service, isn't it? Yeah, service. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I, I think there was a case um, during the Sydney Olympics 
where somebody complained that they couldn't get online tickets because of the way that the website was structured um, and actually wasn't facing that case. And, and so there's, there's actually um, law already out there. So it, it, it's worthwhile for people to complain if yes. they can't access you know, things on the website uh, anyway, but especially mm -hmm. if it's because of the disability sometimes. To say you know you need to fix this because it doesn't work and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, because there are ways to fix it. It's not it's not actually hard, but it needs like a lot of things thinking about. You know, like if you're building a new building, you put in a ramp, or you you know make it able mm -hmm. for people to access the wheelchair. In the same way as if you're building a website, you make it so that everybody can access it, what, whatever whether they use using screen readers or whatever. So mm -hmm. that's definitely comes under both the disability, uh, yes. the, the human rights and the opportunity. That's thing. right. Mm -hmm. And just on that note, which um, I just jog my memory, that just going back to the complaints on equal opportunity and human rights, this is very important. If you do make out a written complaint and you put one in the Equal Opportunity Commission and then you go ahead and put one in the Human Rights Commission, they will both strike each other out. So you only have one in one. So you want to sign, which is the correct one. Yes, yes. And and like I said, um, Equal Opportunity Commission, they won't deal with any federal, any Commonwealth legislation. So that's straightforward. You can actually put a state one into the Human Rights Commission and they may refer it back to Equal Opportunity. Right. But, yes, you can't um, put a federal one in the Opportunity Commission because they so, deal with state. So it's, it's always really good to get proper advice. Yes, yes, anything. yeah. So does that advice come from you, Michelle? Um, yes, I can certainly advise you. I to say, because I so you did mention that we can get independent legal, but in lots of cases we don't have the finances. So no. what's the touching point or the contact point through you? It's just oh, right. and, and that's, that's a good point. Because our service, um, my service, compared to the other solicitors in, at Sussex Street, I don't have a means test. Mm -hmm. So that means I can take anybody, any clients from any background. But if the person is quite vulnerable and really disadvantaged, mm -hmm. then, a, then a, a, a course I will represent them in the commissions. Now, sometimes, because I'm only working there myself, but I can certainly give out legal advice of probably which way yeah, is the best way to go. And I often find that clients feel that it's quite cathartic actually writing the complaint down themselves and going through, getting it all off their chest, and then they'll say, oh, Michelle, can you just have a, a look at this? Have I covered everything or need to put more in? Or, no. that, that's fine too. But just one question I had that probably a lot of people with fibroid come across is that because, um, because you get sick, gradually get sicker and sicker and you can mm -hmm. do less and less, um, if you're in a workplace where you weren't really sick beforehand and then you gradually mm -hmm. become sick mm -hmm. and less able mm -hmm. and you, you, know, you might use up all your annual, your, your sick leave and then you're cheering up your annual leave and all that. It, does the, the place that you work for have to make allowances for you getting sicker and sicker? Yes, you know, if, if yes you they do. Sit down yes, they do. And um, from my experience is that if you are sick, you don't want to chew up all your leave no. because you're sick. So I, what I favour is the client actually telling the employer, this is this is what's happening. And yes, I can come in to work, but it might not be until 12, but perhaps if I can work from home in the morning and making those reasonable adjustments so you can still feel part of the workforce, but we know, or they might reduce down your time at work, but not lose your status at the job. Because I, I found with a, a number of clients that they, they have become ill but, but also, once they become sick, then they take away their seniority, they take taken yeah. away their responsibilities, they are taken away the decision making. You know, I can still make decisions, I know I'm not, you know, 100% you know, all the time, but I 
oh, I've completely lost my faculties. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think that's something that should be with the client and the employer. And what about the, going the other way as well? Like if, if there are times when I know I personally feel like I have lost all my faculties and can't make a decision that, um, you know, when I can't drive or, you know, those sorts of things, what obligations do I have towards my employer as well? Like if, if I don't tell them I'm sick and then make a mistake because I'm sick, does, you know, does it go the other way as well? Well, you do. You have a duty to your employer to tell them. And if you're using, if you're a courier or something, you want to put other people at risk even on the roads. Mm -hmm. So I, there is a duty of, of letting your employer know. And if they do throw that in your face and come up to unfair dismissal, termination, then that will that will come under either Fair Work Australia or Industrial Relations Commission. Yeah, the, sorry, I'll sit, I'm asking lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was actually very discriminated against in my last job, and I'm sure that my last job contributed towards how sick I got. But, mm -hmm. um, uh, but and they were quite bullish about everything. But, um, so how far does it go though? Like if it got to the point where I just could not do my job anymore and they obviously wanted me out mm. and they made my life pretty uncomfortable. You know, they, they Did they sort of force you to resign? Well, basically, yeah, like I, I couldn't stand up for, for a 12 hour shift anymore. We weren't allowed to sit down. We had our 10 minute break every two hours. Mm. And, um, and it was a very physical job, but very, you had to concentrate as well because you were in dangerous equipment. So how, if you actually can't do the job, and, and what, what, why does the employer, I can't, if I was an employer mm. and someone couldn't do the job, would I still have to keep employing them? Mm. Well, well that's a good there? question. And, and the point is also, if you want to keep you on, why can't he put you into some other employment? Yeah. Within that job? Well, it would depend on the size of the company. Yes. But if there was nowhere else. Or train you up to do something else. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a difficult one because there's a point of inherent requirements of the position. You know, if you're employed to be a driver and then you can't do it, most employers I know will try and reasonably try and find you alternative work within the company. And it is really, really hard. It is really hard because they say, well, I employed you to do this and now you can't do it. So I think you have to take it on case by case basis and really work with the employer. And then if he is really going to push you out the door, then you need legal advice either from the employment law service or if, we, if it's a discrimination matter, then us. It is, it's very hard. But I, I would say try and work, if you want to stay in the job, in the company, then try and work with the employer and hope the employer will be reasonable enough to you know, find something else within the company to help you out. Yeah. On the case situation, do they in the last months or years, I guess it depends on the case, does it have to be Yes. Average, so mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll just give you a bit of a rundown. Um, depending on the case, uh, remember we only got 12 months to lodge a complaint from the last discriminatory action or behaviour. So that's the 12 months limitation period. I go on what the, the client will instruct me what to do. He, they will give me instructions, they'll give me the background of what's happening, why they feel they're being discriminated, what their medical condition is. And they may want us to negotiate first with the employer or the other party, whoever it is. Perhaps go in that way first. Because we have to remember that once you get to the commission, the commission looks at what attempts to resolve this problem have you done in the first, at the first place? So we try and do that way, and if not, and they're saying, well, oh, I've got no choice but to go to the Commission, and this is what we'll do. So it can be, some, sometimes we can be about 12 months. And the costs, is it, you know, say if you go to, no, it's not a question. 
Um, when you go to either commission, it's free. Yeah. I'm free. <laughs> we don't charge anything. And we represent people if we've got the, um, a, a good, successful, and we will represent people in the commission as well if they don't feel they can go through it within themselves or they have difficulty reading and writing or vulnerability. And we're happy to represent them too. Um, we don't charge anything for our service. Well, I think that's, that deserves a round of applause. By the Commonwealth. And so, thanks to the Commonwealth, um, we don't charge any of my talk. Thank you.